Shalom. Welcome to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein of the Jewish Federation of Greater Des Moines. And uh, in a few minutes, we'll hear from Aidan Finkelstein, who just came back from a four-month uh, study uh, in Israel program. And um, before I do our World in Five Minutes, I'd like to thank our benefactor for this show, Dr. Ronald Bergman of Bergman Folkers Cosmetic Surgery and Spa. Uh, Without his support, we wouldn't be able to have our show and bring uh, to you uh, understanding the world. So this is the World in Five Minutes. Uh, There are a lot of um, uh, crazy things going on in the Middle East right now. There, there really are. Uh, in Turkey, uh, in fact, if you look at the way the Middle East is set up right now, you'd think the whole thing is just collapsing, uh, especially the Arab nations. Um, in Turkey, uh, you see protests against uh, the demolition of a park uh, in Istanbul have turned into tens of thousands of people protesting against the regime all over the country. Uh, uh, protesting against the Erdogan regime, calling um, uh, the prime minister of Turkey a dictator, uh, asking for him to resign. Um, Early on uh, during these protests, uh, the police force used uh, tear gas and violence, uh, high-powered hoses and any number of other things to try to suppress the crowd and injured numerous people. Um, So in the meantime, the protests continue uh, continue on and Erdogan is scheduled to arrive back in Turkey today and there are planned protests at the airport upon his arrival. Uh, we were talking about Iran for uh, the last few months uh, and talking about the fact that the timetable for dealing with Iran's nuclear program was getting shorter and shorter and guess what? There's hardly any news whatsoever about anything having to do with Iran uh, right now other than potentially uh, Iran's uh, Uh, connection to what's going on in Syria. Um, And uh, there have been some protests. Uh, There was a protest in Isfahan uh, against the regime um, at the funeral procession of one of the leading reformers uh, in uh, in Iran uh, who died at age 87. Uh, But meanwhile, the candidates for president in the upcoming election have been handpicked by the mullahs and happen to all be people who support the regime going on. So the chances of any significant reform happening after an election are virtually nil. Uh, The big news, obviously, that's continuing to go on is Syria. uh, And uh, we'll talk more in more detail about uh, Syria later in the show. Uh, Today, there were battles at the Kunetra crossing between Syria and Israel. Um, The battles not between Syria and Israel, but the battles... um, at the Kunetra crossing took place between the, uh, the, uh, the army of, uh, of Assad, the Syrian army, and uh, the rebels uh, for control of that uh, border crossing. Uh, in the past uh, few weeks, as, uh, it has been a reg- fairly regular occurrence that uh, injured uh, soldiers in, on the rebel side have been taken to Israel for treatment. There have been several of them. And it's entirely possible that that various supplies have been uh, going across that border. We don't know. Um, the other news that's going on is that there's a belief that uh, Russia is sending resupply ships to Syria, uh, which may include uh, p- parts of the S-300 uh, anti-aircraft missile system. And if that's the case, that would uh, significantly change the dynamic in the Middle East. Uh, and certainly the dynamic in the Syrian uh, conflict. Uh, As far as Israel goes, there's a lot of uh, peace process talk going on, um, led by uh, our Secretary of State, John Kerry, uh, who's trying to reach out to the parties and get them to renew uh, or restart, really, peace negotiations. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu basically says, "We're we're with that idea, we're happy to come to the table and negotiate. Um... The uh, uh, one of the leading uh, 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 figures in Israel who's not a part of the Likud party, however, Danny Dannon says, no, you're not, uh, that the Likud party and Jewish Home, uh, the two of the big parties in the in the coalition are not interested in a two state solution and are not interested in negotiating. Um, but then, like I said, Netanyahu said they are. 
meanwhile, um, President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority says Israel has to make concessions. And Prime Minister Netanyahu says we'll have talks without concession, without preconditions. Uh, then again, you're sitting in a situation in which Abbas doesn't, uh, Pri- President Abbas doesn't necessarily even represent the Palestinian people for whom he's negotiating uh, because he lost the only election uh, that has taken place, or at least his party lost the only election that has taken place since he's been in office. Uh, and there hasn't been an election in multiple years. And so it's very hard to say that uh, the President Abbas can actually negotiate for the Palestinian people, other than the fact that uh, world bodies simply want him to be able to do so. Uh, there is also the issue of the Palestinian Authority uh, swearing in a new government uh, this week. And um, as I said, this is a new government that's sworn in without having any elections. So um, they just appointed whoever they wanted, basically, and that's the new government. So um, uh, that's that's the peace process in a nutshell. Another thing that's going to happen this coming weekend, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about this next week, is that Sunday happens to be Rosh Hodesh. And uh, last month on Rosh Hodesh in Jerusalem, uh, Women of the Wall uh, led a service, the first time uh, that they've been able to lead uh, a service with, pro- with police protection in the Western Wall Plaza. Uh, and there was a large-scale protest uh, from uh, female students of yeshivas. They were bussed in from all over the country to oppose the Women of the Wall. Um, this was a protest organized by a group called Women for the Wall, which is a, an ultra-Orthodox group. Uh, now uh, there is a uh, uh, protest this month uh, where they're bringing in married men or encouraging married men to come. Um, probably because it will increase uh, the threat level uh, and also because they don't want to expose women to the freedom that re- that uh, women of the wall represented. Uh, there were a number of female students who came to the last protest who actually seemed to find uh, what the women of the wall were doing uh, to be perfectly fine and maybe even what they wanted to do. And so that didn't go over very well um, with the Orthodox rabbinate that had proposed uh, and organized the protest against the women of the wall. So we'll find out what happens next week, but things could get uh, fairly ugly from some of the statements that I've seen circulating uh, in the Israeli media uh, coming from uh, Orthodox uh, leaders who are concerned about the protest uh, that will take place on Sunday. That is the world in five minutes. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. (laughs) Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. Just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do? (laughs) There is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave 
and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I wanna find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not gonna have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me, but is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. Shalom. Welcome back to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein of the Jewish Federation of Greater Des Moines. And we're also joined in the studio by Aidan Finkelstein, uh, who has just returned from a program in Israel. Aidan, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, tell us a little bit about the program you were on. Thanks, David. Um, I'm advocating for a certain program called Tichon Ramah Yerushalayim or TRI is its acronym. Uh, it's uh, a very Jewish-oriented based uh, trip to Israel for anyone who wants to take time off during the school year. You would basically be taking uh, any regular school programs that you would have going on, any school, uh, hard school classes. At the same time, you're sort of just traveling around Israel, learning about its different cultures, different history types going on. Uh, you have a certain Israel core course going on where it's all about just learning all the history of Judaism, all the different cultures, and just all about how Israel was formed and how it operates. You get a very close by uh, introduction into how Israeli politics goes on in some degree. Uh, you get to go to different landmarks and interesting history points all around Israel. Um, it's a very great program to go on. It's it gives you the ability to brag about just going to Israel and traveling a bit as a kid, which is very interesting. Um, I say it's a really good program for anyone who wants to just go off and learn more about Judaism. Uh, it's it's not like other programs where it's taken during the summer. It's taken during school school class time. So anyone who goes to Ramah camps has time to afterwards go directly to Ramah camps instead of skipping a year. It's very good for anyone who wants to educate their child on more Israel-type stuff, and uh, it's a very good place to go to. Where is it centered? Uh, it's centered deep, uh, just in the main city of Jerusalem. Uh, it's a very safe place to be. It's very nice, and it's always very hot. Uh, it encourages just you have to drink water all the time, but it's a very great place to be. It's placed in a place called uh, the, Youthstein Gold, the Goldstein Youth Village, where there are a couple of other programs going on with, uh, I think, a few uh, Jewish-based Russian and French children's groups. But uh, it's very nice. It's very calm. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very good place to be. How large a group of students were you with? Uh, the size of the group can vary from year to year. I've heard there are times when there were groups of 50 to 60 to even 70. My group was about 45 or so. Uh, it was a strange ratio of, there were about 10 guys and 30 girls. It was interesting ratio, but it still worked out pretty well. Um, but like I said, it changes from year to year. You were there for a number of Jewish holidays. Which ones did you observe? Oh, we uh, observed a good amount. Uh, I thought Lagba Omer was a good one. We spent our nights uh, sort of touring around, visiting different bonfires going on. Uh, during times like Rosh Chodesh, we had special services going on, and there are even some uh, of the female students who went on to actually go and advocate for Women of the Wall, for those who were extra spirited. I know that it was uh, a lot of fun for them. They got to help out with uh, current events in Israel. You were there for Purim? Yeah, that was uh, one of the highlights. Very okay. much fun. Where were you for Purim? Uh, we mainly stayed in Jerusalem. I know there's like a different uh, dated time set for Jerusalem Purim rather than other places like Tel Aviv Purim. But it was still a lot of fun just sort of having small little parties and learning more about things happening around us. What was Passover like in Israel? Um, very strange. Uh, it's one of those places where it's uh, 
very widely celebrated thing. I don't know if if you're aware, but in places like Israel, Jewish-based holidays are more popularized. Uh, on places like Shabbos, the streets literally just close down. People walk everywhere. Um, with things like Passover, it was more popularized, and you know everything with any kind of bread or grain-based stuff was really just not allowable in most places. Um, during that time, uh, you're sent out to live with any kind of host family. I stayed with a good friend of mine on the program, and we had a lot of fun uh, living near uh, Tel Aviv. It was really just a good, good place to be. What were some of the uh, lecturers you heard? Oh, we had various uh, speakers coming in to speak with us. To, we had a left-wing speaker, had a right-wing speaker. Um, very recently, the last speaker we had on the program was a man living up on the Golan Heights. Uh, he just sort of talked about how uh, at certain points it was very tense, but it's not as not as aggressive as one would assume about things happening over by the Syrian border, the Golan Heights. You had a Palestinian speaker as well? Yeah, we did. We did have a Palestinian speaker over during our time visiting the Knesset. Uh, he was very, very calm, very uh, logical, very analytical. He was making very good, reasonable assumptions and points, and it really opens your eyes about the different perspectives going on around. And you had mentioned uh, that you had a speaker talking about uh, the Six-Day War, um, that one of your recent speakers was was a paratrooper? Yes. Uh, the last speaker we had, who was living up in the Golan Heights, he was a soldier, a paratrooper, and he had been uh, working for the Israeli Defense Force since uh, the Six Day War, or so, and he was actually one of the paratroopers that went and raised the Israeli flag over the Western Wall when we captured Jerusalem. Now, I know uh, one of the one of the obvious things that that this program is is a conservative movement based program, and uh, there have been a lot of issues in Israel lately dealing with the reform movement, the conservative movement, and pluralism issues. Did did you hear about any of those, and what was said on your program? Um, while the program is based around the conservative movement, uh, we get plenty of time to learn about uh, other choices and uh, variations of Judaism, orthodoxy, and and whatnot. And it was, we did hear about it, but it was more about just learning about different perspectives people had on Judaism. I don't know if there was any sort of mainline target on who we were learning about, but it was, it was a very good way to learn about different people's points of view. You spent some time in the army of some sort. What was that like? Oh, that was very interesting. Uh, there's a program in Israel called GADNA, which is another acronym. I'm not sure what it means specifically, but it's really just a program run by the Israeli Defense Force to give any young teens a taste of what it's like to be in the Israeli army. We would spend a, we spend a small amount of time on a base in uh, Stay Boker, where we wore military, authentic military fatigues. Uh, we slept in tents outside, and we were ordered around by various commanders uh, on various points. Uh, I think the highlight of Gadna, in my opinion, was we spent an entire day learning about how to operate and take control of a firearm, an uh, M16 rifle. Uh, we spent a good deal of time just learning about the different shooting positions, all the safety mechanisms, and just how to stay out of trouble and be safe with the firearm. And in the very end, we went out to a shooting range nearby, and we all got to fire off a few rounds. It was Now, yeah. as part of your studies, you took Hebrew. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Um, at the beginning, they have you take a few tests to see like what level you're at, how well you can speak and everything. Uh, I got into the, med the uh, medium level, the intermediate level. Uh, it's a good way to, they're very small classes, by the way. It's a good way to strengthen your Hebrew speaking. It's especially easier there because everyone all around you has it as a first language. Although at some times they can be a bit uh, condescending and sort of just talk in English primarily, but it's always a good way to work on your Hebrew skills because it's very necessary there. And you enjoyed the rest of your academic studies as well, I understand? Uh, definitely. Um, what did all, you take? All the classes there are very small to begin with, so oh. it's very simple. Um, 
I was one of the few kids who took uh, advanced placement courses, AP courses. Um, one of my smallest classes was uh, AP Environmental Science. I was the only student there. It was the best in your class. That yeah, was the exactly. Class. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but I took all the hard, all the mandatory classes like uh, math, science, uh, social studies. It was I got all my credits on there, and I'm sure most most schools all around the country accept these credits, so there's no issue there. But yeah, I got all my studying done at the same time. I had a really fun time there. I had a lot of fun. Well, where were some of the places you saw in Israel? Oh, we went all over. Um, I know that our first teal or hike across Israel, we traveled to a small place called Berotaim, where we stayed in Bedouin tents uh, during the one week out of the year when it rains in the desert. Very interesting. Uh, we rode camels around. We uh, t- had a taste of uh, Israeli-style food, and, and um, it, was very, it was a very good bonding experience. And you went to Sfat? Oh yeah, definitely Sfat. A uh, very small village, but it's very like tightly knit, and there's a lot of different things going on there. Um, yeah, it was one of those. It's another one of those highlighted places we went to. Tel Aviv, you went to the beach. Definitely, Tel Aviv was another uh, highlight of the trip. What we is that spent like? a lot of time just walking around the city. It's very. Uh, it's a lot like New York, sort of. Uh, one thing I've heard about is that Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are like New York, that they're just different from the rest of the country. Uh, it was very populated, very active, very uh, very moving around. Uh, we spent a lot of time just sort of hanging out at the beach, just having a lot of fun. Did you like the students you were with? Yeah, definitely. They're just like anyone else that you would meet anywhere else. Uh, they're just some various Jewish American kids who come from different places. Where do they come from? Um... I had two roommates in my dorm room. Uh, one of them was from Phoenix, Arizona. He was lots of fun. And another one was a kid from Boston. Yeah. Okay. And did you have any uh, sports? Um, well, they're not directly mandatory. Uh, you get a PE credit in the program just for going on all the Tulim. Because it's a lot of exercise. It's very healthy. Uh, but on the, on the youth village that we live in, there's a gym there where you can have any kind of sport. Um, there's a tennis ball court right next to the dorms we live in. And then there's also a small pool where anyone who's interested in that can go for it. What did you do on Shabbat? Uh, Shabbat was celebrated somewhat strictly. I mean, it was encouraged not to use any electronics. Uh, if you were, it'd be in a very closed private off area. But during that time, it was just a lot of rest periods. And, um, we had some morning services where we sort of walked in Jerusalem, down to various synagogues we'd have been assigned to, different little viewpoints for each one we went to. And at the very end of the day, we would have Habdala and maybe special activities, and it was just a very good good time to rest. You were mentioning something about your science teacher comparing the uh, United States with Israel. What was he saying? Oh, yeah, we had a uh, teacher where, talking about Israeli politics, we had him talk about how when you're in America, you can go to any kind of uh, convenience store and you see 40 different types of shampoo or conditioner. And then at the same time, when it comes to political leaders, you just have two people to vote for. That's why Israeli <laughs> government is very different in the sense that there's various parties you can vote for that take up different standpoints in, uh, in the Israeli parliament. What was the highlight of the trip? One last thing. What was the highlight of the trip? I personally liked Godna, but um, others did not as well. They didn't have that. They didn't have that certain type of discipline. But a lot of kids just enjoyed uh, exploring different parts of Israel, just getting to walk around every now and then. Um, one of the highlights, another highlight, was uh, getting to go to places like uh, Ben Yehuda Street and uh, the uh, Jerusalem Shuk, where you can buy very cheap uh, clothing and crates of fruit, just very healthy and very nice. Cool. Well, thank you for joining us, Aiden. And uh, we'll be right back after a short break uh, with more Understanding the World. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drink, dance, party. 
Kitties is the ultimate dance club in Des Moines. A huge dance floor with room to move, three bars to keep your drinks full, and kicking DJs playing all your favorite dance music. At Kitties, we've always got your birthday party planned with birthday Fridays. That's right, when your birthday rolls around, there's only one place to go. Gather up your friends and head to Kitties, where you drink free on the Friday of your birthday week. Find out more about birthday Fridays at kittiesusa.com. Kitties, all kinds of people, all kinds of music, all kinds of fun. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Shalom. Welcome back to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein and the Jewish Federation of Greater Des Moines. And uh, we have all kinds of different things to talk about. Um, I, I thought uh, we'd kind of get more into what's going on with Syria, Mark, because um, things keep... it. it it keeps getting to be bigger and more of a mess, and we really don't know where things are going. What are well, just the, the basic question is, how do the Alawites relate to the other sects of, of Islam at this point? Who are their allies? Well, and, and what are the possibilities? I mean, really, that's, that's the, big, the big issue. And I, was, I said... Um, uh, Somebody was saying that it looked like the Obama administration was was aiming at keeping Assad in power at this point, and um, and they were kind of shocked by that. And then I went through a list of what the possibilities were if Assad, you know, as a result of the civil war. So you know, the the first possibility, and this is just listing off seven, and there's certainly multiples of of this, but one possibility is that Assad stays on relatively weak, okay? He's not, not as a strong leader, but as a weak leader, um, and holds off the rebels, uh, solidifying Alawite rule and Iranian influence uh, for some time to come. Now, obviously, in order for this to happen, this would mean uh, that the United States and others would want to uh, avoid forcing Russia to step in on Assad's side, because if Russia comes in strongly on Assad's side, then you're going to have a, a strong Assad in power, and that could result in uh, a lot of other fallout. Um, there's certainly going to be desire, if Assad maintains power, to have him stop or, or avoid large-scale killing of, of his population, because that would be uh, incentive for others uh, to step in and try to do something in Syria. So basically, you'd end up with a weak Assad, Russia staying out, everybody else staying out, and Assad not killing large portion of his population. Um, this may well be the easiest solution to achieve, which is which is why it it it's near the top of the list and needs to be discussed. Um, I'll go through these, and then we can we can talk about these a little bit. Uh, another option is basically a Muslim Brotherhood takeover uh, from with help from the Free Syrian Army, 
uh, which is kind of the rebel side of the Syrian army and the rebel side of the formerly pro, the formerly governmental oriented people. And this would be an organized military uh, group. Um, radical Islamist groups would also aid in this overthrow of the government. Uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood would come to power as being the dominant political force among the Sunni, uh, the Sunni Muslim groups. And things would look more like Egypt as far as the way Egypt is set up. Um, and that would be the best case scenario. The worst case scenario would be more like Sudan, uh, where you'd have kind of a militant uh, leadership in power that would then use that power against everybody else. Um, but you'd also have the added situation of massacres of the Shia, Alawites, and Christians, uh, which is part of why the Christians have been supporting uh, the regime at the moment, uh, and would almost certainly bring advanced weaponry into the hands of those who would use them against the U.S., uh, Russia, uh, because of Chechnya, uh, Europe, throughout the Arab world, and Israel. So this is seen as a very bad option, but it's probably the second most likely option at this point, the second most likely development. Um the third and fourth options are really, really bad, but uh, we'll, we'll get into them. So here you've got, well, actually, the third option is, is really, really bad, uh, which would be a regional conflict. So let's say things continue to escalate. Uh, Russia decides that it needs to step in and support the, um, uh, the Assad regime. Uh, they're using more advanced, stronger weaponry. You have spillover into Israel, spillover into Turkey. Uh, in fact, today, just so that you know, uh, there were two rockets that landed in Israel. Uh, there's no belief that they were fired at Israel, but because the fighting is going on along the border in Kunetra, right by Israel, uh, an overshot of the, the rebels that or whoever was being attacked the rockets landed in Israel. Now, if you think about that being stronger weaponry, more powerful weaponry, um, you would end up drawing in Israel. If that goes into Turkey, you could end up drawing in Turkey into the conflict uh, much more significantly. So you could end up with um, a regional or even larger conflict that would involve Turkey, potentially NATO, the United States, and Russia. That spirals out of control and can be extremely bad. Um, that, that could end up being a regional war or a much larger war, and that's definitely not a scenario that anybody wants. Uh, you could end up with a scenario that's like Afghanistan or Iraq, um, long-term U.S. or U.N. involvement. Um, Russia, at this point, for this option to work, Russia would basically have to say, we're just washing our hands. We're, we're not going to deal with it. You want Assad out of power, you take care of it. Um, it, it's really it, it's really unlikely that Russia would do that for a lot of different reasons, but that's the only re the only way this scenario even starts. So um, just as an idea, um, Israel would then face uh, cross border threats constantly uh, because rebels would basically uh, and other militants would basically just launch rockets and other things from Syria into Israel. Uh, and with occupying NATO or U.S. forces there, Israel would be unable to retaliate in any fashion. So this would mean uh, basically a stalemate of the situation from Israel's perspective, no real solution in Syria, and a defended Syrian government, uh, whatever it is, uh, that would prevent Israel from retaliating. So that wouldn't necessarily be good. And like I said, it's unlikely anyway, because it's unlikely Russia is going to stop uh, supporting the regime. Um, another possibility is essentially balkanization, which would be um, splitting of the country into Alawite, Shia, and Christians on the one hand, um, Kurdish in the north, and, and Sunni sections uh, in the east. Um, but this would also lead to other conflicts going on, and people need to understand that. The Kurdish conflict, they develop a Kurdish conflict because you'd end up with a relatively independent Iraqi Kurdish population You'd end up with a relatively independent uh, Syrian Kurdish population, and then you're dealing with Turkish Kurdish population and Iranian Kurdish population, and you're suddenly dealing with a regional war again. So this is not necessarily the easiest thing. Uh, meanwhile, the Alawite Shia Christian sector would end up affecting Lebanon much more, and you could potentially bring Lebanon into the conflict. So. This might actually be the second best scenario uh, as an option of, of a result for the civil war, which tells you how bad this situation really is. 
Um, you could potentially have a um, a free Syrian army take over with the Muslim Brotherhood having a major role. Um, uh, that's a possibility, but it's it's uh, at this point seems less likely. Um, that would really be the second best scenario, I should say. Uh, that would be a free free Syrian army take over um, with the Muslim Brotherhood playing a large role. Um, it may even be the best scenario, uh, but it's not extremely likely at this point because the United States and Europe did not step in to support the Free Syrian Army when it had the chance to do so earlier. And now there's some question as to whether or not they have the strength and ability uh, to uh, to defeat uh, Assad's government. And then finally, the last option, the last possible result, I should say, is essentially Somalia, total anarchy. Uh, uh, and uh, if you think about total anarchy in, in Somalia, it's bad enough where everybody's running around firing weapons with an occasional RPG. In Syria, you're talking about all kinds of advanced weaponry, chemical weapons, biological weapons, major, major weaponry. Uh, and uh, it, it, the, the result of that is so ridiculous and, and, uh, and catastrophic that no side wants to go in that direction. So there, everything that all the other options basically would be ones that that everybody would try to go for rather than the last one, um, and so that's the scenario that I see playing out. And none of those are good options. Well, the other aspect is uh, how Hezbollah plays into it, and who is driving Hezbollah, and for what reason. Well, Hezbollah definitely wants Assad to stay in power if they can, because that's their ideal. They they want Assad in power, and they want uh, they want Iran to continue to support them through Syria. If, if a, in any of these other scenarios, Hezbollah is severely weakened. Um, what we're seeing now, actually, is that Hezbollah is already weakened. Uh, well, because Iran a lot of, yeah, yes. is having to shift its weapon supply route from Syria to Sudan. Um, and that's much less efficient and much less effective for Iran to do. Plus, they're facing opposition in Sudan where they didn't face opposition in Syria. Uh, Hezbollah is taking a lot of casualties in Syria itself, it sounds like. And maybe some of those numbers are being suppressed in order to uh, to not destroy the morale of uh, the Hezbollah people. Well, and you also have an issue of that the Hezbollah fighters aren't necessarily just fighting the Syrian civil war. They're fighting a Sunni Shia war. And uh, the, the problem that Hezbollah has to deal with, the additional problem that Hezbollah has to deal with, is no one sees, that, sees Hezbollah as Syrian. They're simply Shia who are fighting for Shiism uh, against the Sunnis who are fighting for Sunnism and uh, Sunni Islam. And so uh, they're fighting two wars. And when you're fighting two wars at the same time, <laughs> you're you're in you're in big trouble. So Hezbollah actually has it even worse, I think, than uh, than the Assad regime has it. The Assad regime knows where the boundaries are. Uh, I think Hezbollah has no boundaries. Hezbollah is fighting everywhere, and the Sunni, particularly the non-Syrian Sunni fighters that are there, the the rebel groups that are coming in from all over the world, including Al Qaeda. They are happy to go after uh, Hezbollah anywhere, anytime. They don't care whether they're operating in a Sunni area or they're operating in a Shia area or even operating in Lebanon. So um, uh, Hezbollah is really in a, in a tough situation here, and they probably do need to be resupplied. And Iran is probably going to try to resupply them uh, because if Hezbollah falls, if Hezbollah weakens significantly, then Assad is going to be weakened significantly because Hezbollah is basically the front-line defense. Are you uh, convinced that Russia has indeed sold Syria its weaponry? Well, we know they've sold the weaponry. They've already said they sold. The deal was completed a few years ago. They just haven't delivered the weaponry. Um, there are reports right now um, that there may be uh, – that some of the weapons may be on ships in the Mediterranean headed to Syria. Uh, we don't know if those ships contain the S-300 missile system. Um, they're almost certainly containing weapons and other supplies to resupply the regime. I mean, some of it may be medical and other things. The regime needs other things besides just weaponry. Um, but the, the S-300 itself could well force the hand of some of the the surrounding governments to 
to talk invasion. And the Russians may not want to do that. The, the Russians may not want to force Israel's hand and say, okay, you can't use your airplanes, but, or they may not want to have Israel just take out those weapons with airstrikes the second they step, you know, the second they hit ground in Syria. I, I don't know. Uh, that would certainly be a way to escalate the conflict. If Russia really doesn't want Assad in power, then that would be a way to do it. Give him the weapons, encourage an invasion from Israel and, and potentially the United States, and, and then walk away. But I don't think Russia wants to do that. I think Russia uh, understands that having, for, for Russian influence in the region, losing the Syrian port would be an enormous blow. Because if you think about it, the Russians really don't have another good port that they can go to in the entire Mediterranean, entire Eastern Mediterranean. Yes, they would sure. lose access across the entire Eastern Mediterranean if they did that. So Russia really needs to keep Assad in power, but they also need to keep the conflict from escalating to the point that the Israelis or, or U.S. would have to act. A couple of weeks ago, the thought was that maybe a no-fly zone would be imposed on part of Syria. Has that idea simply gone away or is it simply impractical? Well, yeah, but a no-fly zone would, imp would imply that the U.S. or Israel could fly planes over Syria to pretend, prevent other planes from flying over Syria. Uh, it could be that the Russians decide to send the S-300 system in there to, to make it a no-fly zone that's simply controlled by Syria. I mean, that would essentially be a no-fly, the same thing as a no-fly zone. You just prevent the Israelis from doing anything or the United States and make it much worse for the United States. Now, this is assuming that the United States and Israel don't have a way to defeat the S-300 missile system, which I, I'm not entirely sure is the case. It certainly, they certainly haven't been tested against it in battle. That particular uh, missile system is not operable against uh, ground troops. It's, it's a, a ground-to-air missile system, yeah. and uh, the Free Syrian Army don't, don't have airplanes, do they? No, and, and the, the other issue is the S-300 missile system could, could potentially threaten planes at uh, Ben Gurion Airport in Israel. I mean, you're, you're talking about something that could threaten planes in a significant distance around Syria, not just over Syrian airspace. So when we're talking about what the threat really is, the threat of the S-300 is much greater than simply uh, as a defensive weapon to prevent uh, uh, airplanes from attacking Syrian, uh, Syrian territory as such. Now, over the last week we've heard about the uh, back and forth over the city of Qusair. Uh, originally, the rebels had made... Uh, incursions into the city and as of yesterday looks like the uh, Syrian troops itself had retaken the area but it, we're talking about Kenetra or Kusir we I don't remember what's going on in Kusir specifically I know I know there's there's Kenetra um, there was the issue today of we're not even knowing who is in control of the border crossing into Israel um, the last report that I saw uh, was that it was it, they, they don't even know whether the Syrian government or the rebels are in control of the Syrian side of the of the border with Ye Israel. Yesterday's headline was the Syrian rebels withdrew from the Syrian town of Qusir after an onslaught by the Syrian army and Hezbollah fighters killed hundreds of people. A rebel statement said Wednesday. So Qusir is Qusir is west, right, by the, the Lebanon border. Yes. So. Um, this is one of the things that's, that's going on here is that, that uh, there's a lot of back and forth going on uh, and uh, a lot of people are dying. Uh, in this case, we're talking about fighters dying, but uh, uh, there, there's certainly um, some concern that we're going to have civilians involved. And depending on which way this battle starts going, um, that you could have more advanced weaponry used against civilians. Uh, when well, you have so much hatred and so much ethnic division in Syria um, that uh, it, it's, it wouldn't surprise anybody if either side would launch anti-civilian weaponry against the other side, not just, not just launching uh, uh, anti-military weaponry or using anti-military weaponry. Uh, the issue of the use of uh, sarin gas has probably uh, left the front pages, even though France and Britain said it was definitely used in a limited fashion in Syria. Well, it's definitely part of the arsenal. 
and there, as are a lot of other things. Uh, and but that uh, was supposedly a red line trigger for the United States at one juncture. Well, I mean, we're we're talking about the, the red the red line. I mean, I guess the red line for action is what we're saying. But what does red line actually trigger? I mean, if you don't if you don't say this is part of our discussion of a few weeks ago about the red line. If you don't say that the red line will lead to X, the red line is going to lead to the U.S. imposition of a no-fly zone. The red line is going to lead to U.S. troops coming in. You know, if you don't say that, saying you have a red line is irrelevant. All you're doing is 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 uh, weakening your bargaining position by coming up with something that doesn't mean anything. Well, the United States has consistently tried to use the language of red lines without defining what it actually would mean. They mean like with Iran and the nuclear program. I mean, we're, we're running into um, uh, multiple situations in which we really don't know what the U.S. policy is. And if we don't know what the U.S. policy is, for sure the Syrians don't know what the U.S. policy is or, or anybody else. So yeah. we're, there, there needs to be some real leadership uh, that defines some of these things in order to get the process to move in a direction other than maintaining the status quo. Now, like I said, I'm not so sure that the U.S. policy is not to maintain the status quo, in which case you don't want to put forth any kind of a policy because that means you would have to act. And if you have to act, then maintaining the status quo is not the result you're going to get. You're going to get one of the other ones, and if all the other ones are worse... If all the other options besides the status quo are worse than the status quo, you don't, you don't want to challenge the status quo. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, we now have, uh, and this was big news this week also, uh, the appointment of Susan Rice as National Security Advisor and Samantha Power as ambassador, UN, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. And both of them are essentially advocates for intervention in a lot of different places. Uh, Samantha Power, for sure, uh, as somebody who is a, a major proponent of the right to protect, uh, responsibility to protect, I should say, you know, which is, a, which is a, an idea that nations have a responsibility to protect civilians against the government that's trying to harm them. Well, that's certainly an interventionist philosophy that is directly applicable to Syria. In fact, it's even been discussed by people who want the U.S. or U.N. or European Union or anybody else to go into Syria to protect civilians. So, But what uh, does that mean in a foreign policy that does not want to intervene in the first place? It means that you have a very strange combination. Uh, policy situation. Yeah, yeah, it does. And you've, and you've already got it, an administration that's shown that it is, uh, is very willing to use drones and, and other um, actions to support uh, uh, military intervention in different countries. Uh, in this case, like I said, the, 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 the worst case scenario is a U.S. conflict with Russia that draws in Turkey and, and, other, and Israel and, and Iran and other countries and make, turns into a much bigger, broader conflict. Um, I think no matter what happens, that's the thing that everybody wants to avoid. Russia doesn't want that either because Russia's ability to deal with any conflict in this region is not good. Um, but that's part of why Russia also needs to maintain this particular position. Because if they lose this particular position, they're going to go from not good to horrible. <laughs> Very weak. Do we have any sense at all that uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Kerry, has a handle on this or is thinking strategically or is it coordinating his strategy with the rest of the administration i i would i would i would assume so i would assume that this is a high priority and this is part of why secretary kerry went to russia this is part of why the israelis went and met with russian leaders I and mean, we can talk all we want about the peace process and and you know the the s300 missile system going to going to Syria and all of those things. But the big priority really is preventing a UN, preventing a U.S. NATO Russia conflict over, over Syria. What's going on within Syria is secondary to that. Uh, Does all this really overshadow what's happening in Iran for the moment, or is everything on hold due to the uh, election? Do you think? Well, look, I mean, here's, here's the thing. Um, Iran is so far off the radar, I, I, I feel like it's uh, Ferris Bueller's day off. Anyone? Anyone? I mean, is anyone even paying attention to what's going on in Iran? The answer is no. 
the reality is we had frantic frantic calls that said we were in an urgent situation and that that uh, things with uh, the Rush, the the Iranian nuclear program were getting much worse and then all of a sudden they've completely dropped off the radar. Now, one of the reasons they've dropped off the radar, I have to say, is that the United States moved Israel's timeline uh, back by giving them more advanced weaponry to use against Iran um, and to use in defense against Iran. Uh, that was part of uh, Secretary Hagel's um, uh, uh, actions of the last few months, I think January or February, when when Israel was granted access to more advanced weaponry, that pushes potentially Israel's timeline as to when it had to act against or when it has to act against Iran back, possibly by six months plus. Um, and as long as the Iranians are trying to avoid crossing certain lines, you can continue to move the situation back without actually solving it. But at some point, you're going to run into a, into a situation in which you are, actually are going to have to act. And because of uh, uh, the um, uh, kind of crazy foreign policy situation we have here, I don't know what the situation is. I don't know what the result of this is. Um, you you also have a situation, um, speaking of which, in, in the Arab League, and this has been written about by Barry Rubin and others, um, where it's fairly clear that you have all of the Sunni nations on one side against the Shia with Turkey kind of on the outside. Uh, and um, with that being the case, there's a lot more support for action against Iran than there may have been uh, a few years ago. You don't think, though, that the... Uh anti-missile uh, batteries on Israel's border has anything to do at all with uh, Hezbollah? Because obviously Hezbollah could launch dozens and dozens of rockets at any one time. Yeah, there, there have been all, there are all kinds of issues about the fact that Iran and Hezbollah both probably have enough launchers that they can overwhelm the Israeli rocket defense systems. So Israel can't count on those systems being full protection. They can count on, a, they can protect against a rogue launch. They can protect against kind of low scale rocket attacks, but anything more than that is going to trigger a, a full scale Israeli response. So if, if Israel sees a thousand rockets coming from, from uh, you know, a, a couple hundred launchers in Iran, it's not going to, it's not going to say, uh, you know, we're going to, respond in a small way. I mean, you're going to end up with a massive response at that point. Now, the same thing's true really with Hezbollah. Hezbollah at this point is in a very weak position militarily. and But they're um, very adamant that they don't want to lose. They say, it, they put it in the terms of they can't afford to lose. They can't afford to lose Syria because if they lose Syria, they're going to lose everywhere else. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're in, in such a bad situation that I don't think... Um, they, they can afford um, to lose on any front. But if, if Syria, if, what, if their actions in Syria continue to weaken them and they can't get resupplied properly, they could end up losing in, in Lebanon even before there's a, uh, even without there being a war that involves them directly. Let's touch briefly upon Rami Hamdallah, who is the new prime minister of, uh, of the Palestinian Authority. Okay. Do you think he has much of a personality to begin with? Well, I don't know much about him at all, to be honest, and I don't think that many others do. Except he's an academic from An Najah University, which is. I mean, you're you're dealing with a situation here in which the people who are recognized as leaders, certainly from outside the Palestinian Authority, and I think even among. Palestinians more broadly are not involved in this government. The, the specu you have a boss and a bunch of people they don't yeah. know. The speculation is that the international monetary community is looking very closely at uh, Hamdallah to see if he has the sense to go with uh, a, a pro-Western approach rather than something more uh, more domestic. They want to know what the implications are of losing Fayyad. Because Fayyad is, is somebody they liked. Fayyad had a very good economic policy, and um, you know when you're when you're dealing with a change such as this, that this is a situation in which um, you're asking the international community to invest huge amounts of money in the Palestinian Authority, 
And your your main argument about the peace process is that the Palestinian Authority is capable of state building uh, and creating the institutions, particularly the economic institutions, that are necessary for the functioning of the state. And Fayyad, Fayyad could gave that. that impression. Fayyad gave the impression that, that he was capable of that. There's some question as to whether or not Hamdallah has the ability to do that at all. Uh, he certainly is not a known commodity. And when you're dealing with investment, and this is investment, it's a risk reward, uh, you know, concern here. But for the most part, the World Bank and these other organizations are very risk adverse organizations. They want guarantees. They don't want risk. And Fayad, they had some idea of what they were going to get. They had a good idea that that investments with Fayad were going to work. With Hamdallah, they have absolutely no idea. They have no idea. They have no idea how it's going to be invested, and they have no idea whether or not what their investment is going to be is going to be stable. In fact, they don't know whether or not Fayad's investments are going to be stable at this point. What's already there is going to be stable. Um, And, uh, you know, the Israeli government is really an unknown at this point because we have a a relatively new Israeli government that has uh, got a pro-peace camp and an anti-peace camp functionally, and um, while they're certainly willing to negotiate, um, there's a question of how rapidly are they willing to negotiate? And are they, are they willing to retaliate if the Palestinians go in, in a different direction? I mean, and the retaliation doesn't, we're not talking military retaliation here. We could be talking about economic retaliation, in which case that could change the whole dynamic of, of, the, of any investment in the Palestinian Authority. And meanwhile, people like Tom Friedman continually goad the, uh, the Israelis into pushing their own government to do something that the Israelis do not want to do themselves. Well, I think the Israelis the Israelis want a peaceful solution. Absolutely. So the question is the, the the question is how do you achieve it without damaging what you currently have? And as I as I as I've tried to say, as I've said repeatedly over the last decade, um, is that this argument that the status quo cannot be maintained forever is simply wrong. In fact, that's the mild use of the term, but I'm not allowed to use the terms that I would generally apply to that statement um, because this is this is television and I don't want it recorded forever. But the 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 situation really is that the status quo is going to be the solution until there's a better solution presented. You don't. The status quo is is actually an option. It always is an option. But and and so until you're until the in, the Israelis and the Palestinian Authority are presented with something that's going to guarantee them better, more prosperous, safer, secure um, situation, they're not going to they're not going to take any risk to move forward. Right now, the situation in the West Bank is relatively good. The economy is doing pretty well, and there's no military threat coming from anywhere. Why would they want to change that? In but, Gaza, uh, you got a situation right now where it's relatively secure. There's relative prosperity. In fact, they're doing better than Egypt across the border. So why do they want to jeopardize anything? And and in Israel, the, the economy is doing better than the rest of the world or the rest of the industrialized world. So what does Israel have to gain? So all these people who are saying everybody needs to make concessions or everything is going to go to hell in a handbasket are simply not accurate. There's no reason to push that way. It, well, that may be the case, but Kerry's betting the bank on his approach of pushing a solution now. And I, I feel reading Tom Friedman, it's, it's Friedman's desire to have Israel, number one, accept the, Amer- the Arab peace initiative to begin with on the table, then move things forward there. Well, and the Arab Peace Initiative that's on the table right now is basically just the same as the Arab Peace Initiative that was on the table before. So you have multiple questions. First of all, whether or not that's, you know, whether or not uh, the Palestinian Authority can actually agree to it uh, and accomplish it. And two, um, what what Israel is able to do. There's still a lot of negotiations to go. Uh, and none of this takes into account the changes that have occurred among the Palestinians over the last eight years uh, and really over the last decade plus. Uh, so um, as, as I say, you need negotiations always need to start at the present and then they need to move forward from there. Uh, we'll talk more about this as we go forward. Next week, by the way, we have a very special guest who's going to join us, uh, Rabbi Arthur Waskow of the Shalom Center. 
Um, Rabbi Waskow is um, is an expert on any number of, of issues. Uh, we're still not even sure what we're going to talk about yet, from the Jewish renewal movement uh, to Aleph, uh, the uh, uh, rabbinical and other and cantorial uh, uh, seminary that's formed uh, that he was part of the founding of uh, the civil rights movement that Arthur, Arthur Waskow played a, a, a role in, uh, environmental activism, uh, which he still does a lot of today, uh, social action issues of any number of issues, and, and also uh, various peace issues, starting with the Vietnam War and moving forward into the present. So there are any number of issues uh, that we will talk to Arthur Waskow about next week. We're very excited to have him on. Thank you for uh, joining us this week on Understanding the World, and we will see you next week.